thank you for allowing me to tell the students a little of what we do in my group here at Northwestern. Uh, obviously, I'm not, I can't tell you about everything we do. I will have one slide about the overall uh, theme in my group, but I want to concentrate about one story that we've been working on for the last 10 years and walk you through the process of how uh, research in an actual lab and how many graduate students would be involved, postdocs, and taking it all the way from just an idea to now will be implemented in the field. Uh, and anything in between. Uh, all right, this is, uh, you know, I am here just speaking on my behalf of my group. This is the group that does the research. Uh, this wonderful days outside Northwestern uh, before COVID time. Uh, right now, if I have my group, the, uh, we would need a soccer field to be able to take the same uh, picture in order to do it safely and uh, properly. Uh, this is the collaborators because today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the most toxic chemicals known to us, uh, humankind, uh, and uh, how we detoxify them and get rid of them. But obviously some of that work is uh, so dangerous that we cannot carry it out and we shouldn't carry it out at Northwestern University or any university. It should be carried out by the right people and in this case, uh, we collaborate with the Army labs since uh, they know how to deal with these uh, kind of, uh, you know, chemicals. Uh, this is the funding agencies. You could see the DOD fund uh, a lot of this work, NSF as well uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, MRSEC. This uh, picture, this slide is really a, a cover article uh, for the CME magazine about a couple, a couple years ago. And uh, very soon you might start asking yourself, you know, why Omar is showing us a, a cover picture in a CNE magazine of something that happened about a hundred years ago, which is the early times where, you know, toxic chemicals were used against uh, soldiers and civilians. Uh, to tell you, uh, you could just go yourself, Google what happens in the last five, six years and how many times nerve agents been used around the world. And you'll be surprised, this is not what happened about a hundred years ago in World War I. This happened uh, as, uh, as of a couple years ago and three years ago and five years ago. So this is very topical. And these are some of the uh, types of nerve agents that they are used uh, in, uh, against civilians uh, by uh, governments, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna deal, uh, go into uh, politics. But the question is, uh, as somebody who likes to work on how to save a life, not take one, we want to understand, uh, you know, how does these chemicals work in order for us to stop them from working and actually deactivate them? We all humans, we have an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Its job to stop a neurotransmitter from keep giving you the same signal to stop an action after you are done with the action. For example, now uh, I was told open uh, and take a sip of water. And once I do that, this enzyme comes and destroy that message. And now I would stop, keep drinking. Now, if this agent, and in this case, I want to show you one of the agents, Sarah comes and it binds to the, where that reaction takes place and how the enzyme works. It binds there and it binds irreversibly. What does that mean? Now this enzyme cannot do its job. And in return, that now you could stop, have any control over your breathing, over your muscle movement. And in seconds to close to a couple of minutes, you could really uh, get yourself in deep trouble, even to death very quickly. And you could see being able to find protection here is not a new topic. I picked some pictures from really, really old pictures. And you could see soldiers wanted to protect themselves and their transportation. And in that case, their transportation was a mule, a donkey, or their dogs. Uh, so you could see, and we'll talk about what's in those canisters and how is it different now 
and where is it going in the uh, future. Let's go to recent times. These warehouses are found in certain locations. You could go Google and find out where, where these warehouses are found. But you could see these chemicals are not really hard to make. And that's why you could find warehouses full of these chemicals. The question is, how can we get rid of these chemicals in a safe manner without uh, uh, harming anyone? In my group, we are interested and we have programs all the way from if you find such a warehouse, how can you uh, get rid of these chemicals in a safe manner uh, to put in materials in masks for uh, soldiers and civilians from even putting these uh, our materials on suits uh, all the way to get in, making antidotes uh, for uh, soldiers, this way they can be protected against these agents. Very soon I will show you what materials we work with and how do they work in order to detoxify uh, these chemicals. We work with a class of material, a porous class of material called metal organic framework. In a cartoon fashion, we rely on metals and metal clusters. Uh, in a cartoon fashion, we have a lot of organic ligands and these assemble together to make three-dimensional materials. I personally decided to work in this class of materials because uh, of the diversity of the amount of uh, metals and ligands you could have. We have a whole periodic table to pick from. Many metals, different properties. We have different types of ligands from very simple things. The main component in a, the plastic drinking water into more complex and anything in between. But more importantly, these materials are programmable. If we know how to design them, that means we could throw everything together like the way you make a soup. And at the end of the day, you will make one material and only one material at 100% yield. So that's the attractiveness of these materials. These materials can be scaled and they already been commercialized by a company I started in 2014. So uh, as I said, these materials have a lot of interesting properties and we'll talk about these properties, but more importantly, uh, say it once again, is the modularity. Being able to choose different uh, organic ligands, different metals that they make, different complexes, different materials for uh, different applications. Because of this diversity, then you are allowed and be able to make materials with different diverse properties and diverse from a physical perspective and a chemical perspective. Because we got to use these materials not in just detoxification of nerve agents. We want to use them for the purification of water. We want to use them for the storage of uh, CO2. We want to use them for the storage of hydrogen in vehicles. And all these programs are materials that we make in my group for these applications. More importantly, these, besides they are really beautiful materials to work with, we get the crystal structure of these materials. What does that mean? Give you activated carbons. I'm nothing wrong with activated carbons. I love activated carbons, but activated carbons is an amorphous material. What does that mean? It's very hard to know exactly what are you making when you make it. Versus here, it's it, you have the structure, you, you could get the crystals, and you could deal with these materials the way they would deal with a small molecule. Being able to know its structure becomes very important in order for us to modify it and make generation one, generation two, generation three, and every generation is better than the generation before it. If we don't know the structure, a lot of times there's a lot of hand waving and it's very difficult uh, to know exactly what we do. This is my group in a nutshell. Uh, we are a synthetic group at heart. We are a, a material chemist. So we do a lot, we will make a lot of materials for a lot of applications. All the way from gas storage, such as for hydrogen, oxygen storage, for F-16 pilots, water purification, to even going all the way to therapeutics and being able to do you know, if you go and do dialysis, how to purify your blood from toxic chemicals. And on the other side is going to be detoxification of uh, nasty chemicals, heterogeneous catalysis, 
uh, being able to stabilize the biological catalyst that God gives us, enzymes and proteins, and we are working on uh, actinide-based MOFs. It's for a different day, for a different topic, uh, unless somebody has any questions about that during Q&A. Today, I want to concentrate only on that uh, square. That's it. And I want to walk you through how we thought about these materials and how we went ahead to make them. And as I said, these are the chemicals that we have to detoxify. At Northwestern, obviously, there is no safety officer. The right brain will allow any professor to work with these materials. So we have to go and make what we call simulant or surrogate, something that mimics the way an agent works, except it's not toxic the way an, a, a nerve agent would be. And you'll see that we learn a lot of these simulants and then we send our materials to the army labs for them to test it against the actual thing. But we cannot test it against the actual thing here at Northwestern. And we wanna do the detoxifications. For example, if you wanna get rid of the serin or phosphorus paste, it's a simple transformation by breaking this BF bond into a POH bond. If you were far away from the screen, you cannot tell the difference between those two molecules and a fluorine versus an OH. This is a very reactive molecule that it interacts with that enzyme and it kills it. This is not so much. Every chemical you have to respect it. Every chemical is toxic. Different toxicity has different levels. The first one kills you in seconds. The second one you could tolerate. So that's where we wanna go from something that kills you to something that you could tolerate. I'm not gonna talk about this, but you also heard about mustard gas. It's also, we work on such a thing and we have to do it by a different way by oxidation, but that's for a different lecture. We gotta to concentrate today only on this hydrolysis of uh, taking the PF on to a POH one. And I'm not gonna go back to 15 years ago when we did not know a lot. I want to take you back to about 10 years ago when we realized that there is an enzyme called phosphotriesterase. It's in a bacteria, and this bacteria lives in farming land. And the army found out that this enzyme does an incredible job at destroying nerve agents. And you might ask yourself why such a bacteria needs such an enzyme. And the answer is, it needs to survive in farming land where insecticides and pesticides are sprayed all the time. And those are nothing but nerve agents for insects and pests. And here, the bacteria over hundreds of years evolved to generate this enzyme to be able to survive. Now us as chemists, we wanna try to be inspired and learn from how this enzyme works for us to go to the lab and make materials that resembles how this enzyme works. And if we zoom in, we find where the action happens in this enzyme. There is, a, or you could call it the active site of the enzyme. You have two zincs bridged by hydroxyl a, and some carboxylic acid. For us, that, and I'm not gonna talk about the mechanism. This is the mechanism, how it works is a simple lowest acid mechanism, happy to discuss during Q&A. A, so this is the active site with the two zincs. We started making materials that has similarities, but with two zirconiums. And you might ask yourself, if nature gave us zincs, why you went to make zirconiums instead of the zincs? Because nature could do what nature just has in its toolbox. Zirconium is not a very common element to be in enzymes. However, zirconium is a better Lewis acid than zincs, which means it should even better be more reactive. That's the differentiation between relying on what nature gives you versus go to the lab and say, we love nature, we wanna be inspired by nature, but we wanna make materials that nature wish to have. And that's what we try to do in my group, and that's really the spirits at Northwestern in general into making materials that it's even nature wasn't able to put together. So this is a this is the you know the small piece 
of some of the metal organic frameworks I will talk about just to describe what it is. Uh, it's based on a cluster of six zirconium. If you guys know what zirconia is, you could think about this, the smallest piece of zirconia, a nano zirconia. It's capped by carboxylic acids. So when we say 12 connected, that means it has 12 carboxylic acids. If I say 11 connected, that means it has 11 carboxylic acid. So what happens to the other one? You have to balance the charge somehow, and it will be replaced by a hydroxyl group and a water molecule. And you'll see soon why is that becomes important. That's how the material looks like in a three dimensional. That's how SEM images of these material looks like. You see, these are beautiful uh, crystals. Uh, it's not amorphous, it's not a mess, uh, and we could get the crystal structure. So how do we uh, follow this reaction? We take our simulant or the surrogate, and because we could, we want to cleave it uh, to take it to the OH, we generate this uh, nitrophenol, and we could monitor that by UV vis. But you might ask yourself, the actual agent does not have that tag that gives you a color. Is there another way of monitoring the reaction? And the answer is yes. We use in situ phosphorus NMR. And here you could actually do the whole entire reaction in the NMR too. That means you could see every 10 seconds we get a spectra. Look how many spectra we have. And you could actually have the program to plot them for you. And in order to see what happens to the starting material and the product, and how's the efficient conversion going from one to the other. Is there any differences between doing it in an NMR versus a, an actual UV vis? The answer is no. Very soon you will see which a catalyst we are using to do that, but for now, uh, just I wanted to show, regardless, if you use a UV vis or an NMR, you will get to the same answer, and that's good, because different people, different lab have different tools, and you need to be able to use tools uh, that you have available to you. Now, we took the first MOF that we made that I showed you the, uh, the crystal structure of, and uh, we did the catalysis. And what do we see? We see a half-life uh, of 50 minutes at room temperature. Now, let's, start, let's chat for 30 seconds what a half-life means and what a half-life of 50 minutes means. A half-life means how long it takes to destroy half of the toxic chemicals. And why uh, the army likes that? This is a standard way they test in, or it doesn't matter where you test it in Australia, if you test it in uh, New Zealand, in the United States, in Saudi Arabia, they need to be able to have a way to you know, measure it in a similar fashion. So they decided on the half-lives. And it has to be done at room temperature. And what does 50 minutes mean? 50 minutes, it's still slow. I mean, as I said, if you are being attacked by a, an agent, you don't have 50 minutes, really. But this is a good start for us to see that our catalyst works. And I got to show you into going into other generations. This slide here to show you. If you're doing material science, you need to make sure that you made the right material, it's the right catalyst, and it works the way it's supposed to. And, uh, and after the catalysis, it did not change. That means you still have the right material. And we do all these techniques from powder, X-ray diffraction, isotherms, uh, TGA, mass balance, ICP filtration. Take my word for it, we do that after every reaction to make sure when we say we have the right catalyst that is working as a heterogeneous catalyst, we're not fooling ourselves. So the first catalyst that we made and we tested it against the surrogate, when we now shipped it to the army and they tested it against the actual agent, they get a half-life of 10 minutes. And you might say, Omar, How's your surrogate is a good reporter for an agent? It's actually, it's harder to destroy the surrogate than the agent. Why is that? 
the agent is more reactive. That's why it kills you. So if it's more reactive, it's easier to destroy. The surrogate is less toxic because it's less reactive. That means actually it's harder to destroy. That means if we make a good catalyst that works against our simulant, we know it's going to work even better against the agent. It's better to be that way than the other way around. Make something that works beautiful at Northwestern and we ship it to the army and it doesn't work at all. You don't want to be in that situation. So now the first generation, it has good things, you know, it works. It takes 50 minutes, still slow. How can we make it better? But what I showed you with the first generation, we were able to make 12 connected uh, zirconium. That means for that reaction to really take, I didn't take you dive deep into the mechanism. Some bonds have to be made and some bonds have to be broken for the reaction to take place. Making and breaking bonds sometimes cost energy and it's slow. We decided how can we do the same reaction without making any breaking any bonds or less challenging bonds to make and break. We decided to make the same exact zirconium cluster, except now the OH and the water that we need to use to hydrolyze the agent are terminal instead of bridging, which means this can leave really easily and you don't have to break this whole entire cluster for you to get that water molecule or that OH to do the hydrolysis. The question is, how do you build that? If we think about zirconium-6 clusters, if you take zirconium metal clusters, you could have them in different geometrical objects. So I'm showing them here from 12 connected to four connected. And we talked about what the connectivity means, the number of carboxylic acids. And you could get them as building blocks that gives you different directionality. How you transfer them from a geometric entities to chemical entities, we could make them all in the lab. So that's nice. Now we go into the organic ligands. We could start thinking about those organic ligands as a geometric entities from benzene dicarboxylic acid to connected, have three carboxylic acids, four carboxylic acids, but we could transfer, transform those particular geometries into actual ligands and actual chemicals. Why is that important? Because we could start playing the game like Tinker Toys. If you have, for example, a square and a cube, you should be able to get different topologies and different morphologies that gives you what you want by just changing the components the way you literally you would change the components in a Tinker Toy uh, bucket. Why I'm using Tinker Toy? Because they are discovered in Evanston uh, and we like to use them as an example for our uh, work. This material, you could see it has eight connected. That means has the eight carboxylic acids. This material we call NU1000. It's built by this zirconium cluster and this ligand. We could make a lot of it. This is the crystal structure. And if you zoom in now into the crystal structure, you could see that's where the action take place. And I will show you very soon how really this particular sponge can take the agent and break it apart into non-toxic chemicals. I'm gonna skip. These are just details, not important, just to show these materials are stable. We could even boil them in water or in acids or whatever, and we don't change anything about them. I told you a lot about this material. Does it work? And the answer is yes. Remember the first one we did, it had a half-life of 50 minutes against the simulant, but it had a half-life of 10 minutes against the agent. The new material we did, now it has a half-life of 15 minutes against the simulant. How does it work against an agent? Now it has two minute half-life against an agent. And by the way, the army wants something about five minutes or less the, the, the faster, the better. That's how we want to make. That means we are now in the region where these materials become intriguing to send them to the field. But we are not there yet. I'll show you, we, are, we started fielding things, but not this particular sample. 
And how does it work? So now I show you this punch and I only typed in. Now you take this punch, the agent comes, and now it's gotta go to the active site where we learned how to build from an enzyme. And a water molecule comes up without breaking or making any bonds. It interacts and reacts with the agent. It breaks it apart. And another water molecule comes from the humidity and kicks up the other part of the agent. And now the cycle starts again. So this material is not like one time use. This is a catalyst. It keeps working. And that's what we want. We want a catalyst on the soldier's uniform. This way the soldier does not have to worry about when is his cartridge is running out or when his material is filled. This material is not gonna fill up. It's gonna keep working. And other, this is another slide. Don't worry about it. Another group went to Argonne National Lab and actually did in situ experiments and showed that the agent, yes, sits exactly where we proposed in our paper that it sits. And it's always nice to get another group from another university to confirm that your uh, mechanism and your material works the way you proposed it to the field that it works. Now I showed you that we could make 12 connected and I showed you we could make eight connected. The question is, if this connectivity means better reactivity, can we even push it forward to a six connected material? And that's generation three. And the answer is yes, we could make it now with even a simpler ligand that you could buy from Aldrich because sometimes being able to commercialize something, it needs to be cheap and scalable. Making something in the lab that costs thousands of dollars a milligram and you could make milligrams of it, nobody's gonna care about. People want something that you could make metric sign of it at a reasonable price. This way it can be fielded. You, you, we make this material, again, this is just the structure, how it looks like. Uh, we take the zirconium-6 with the benzene tricarboxylic acid, and now you could get completely a different morphology. That's our generation three. That's how it looks like. Uh, this is the structure. We know it's the structure because we grew single crystals, and we know where the zirconium-6 cluster works. Does it work? The answer is yes. This material is amazing. We don't even know the half-life before we get the first spectra. The reaction is even complete. That means we know our half-life is faster than 60 seconds. We don't know. It's 10 seconds. It's 5 seconds. But that's good. That's a good problem to have that you have a material is so fast at destroying toxic chemicals that you don't know what is half-life. Technically, we could figure out what it's half-life by cooling it down, but we want the reaction to work at room temperature. Actually, this reaction would even work faster. Let's assume if you are in the desert of Iraq and it's now not 25 degrees Celsius, it's 35 degrees Celsius. This reaction will be even faster. So that's good. That's, that's the type of catalyst you want that it works these are the three generations that I talked to you about. 50 minute half-life, 15 minute half-life, and a very quick, whatever you wanna call that half-life. So one thing we needed to worry about is so far I showed you everything that we are doing it in a condensed fashion. That means you have a beaker, you do the reaction, you provide the water, you provide the base and everything. But that's not how it gotta work in a mask. It need, everything needs to be in a solid. There is no liquid there, and it needs to be able to work with only the water that it gets captured from the humidity. Which means you have to have a catalyst that works at low humidity. Not every place has humidity of 50, 60% relative humidity. There is some certain areas where you actually wanna use these materials there will be a humidity of about 30%. And that's very low. And that's where your catalyst needs to work. So we were able to really heterogenize everything. So we were able to use dendrimers and polymers. And we showed that these dendrimers and polymers work exactly 
the way a homogeneous uh, base would work. So that's good. So now we could heterogenize the catalyst. We could heterogenize the base. And you might ask yourself, why do you need a base? If you remember, I told you the actual agent has that BF bond that we want to break. Once you break that BF bond, you generate HF. Hydrofluoric acid is just as toxic as the agent. It will burn, will burn you internally. That means we need to capture that uh, as well as capturing the agent. And that's where the base comes to play. If you have the base, you will detoxify the pi product that you are generating during the reaction. This is just detail, get a skip. More importantly, now, so we are able to make a catalyst. Now, can we put it on textile? This way we could actually coat the whole suit of the uniform of that soldier. And the answer is yes. So this is the new fabrications of this particular soldier uniform. And our material, it's, it says nanofiber and activated carbon. So our material would be replacing that part of where it says for activated carbon. Why is that? Activated carbon will only capture the, uh, the agent. It doesn't destroy it. That means after a while, it's gonna fill up. Our material, it captures the agents and destroy it into something non, not harmful. So that's why you need that catalytic entity that activated carbon does not have, but our material does. Can we put our catalyst on fibers? The answer is yes. That's where material science comes to play. I don't want to bore you. We have different techniques of putting our materials on these fibers. These are SEM images to show you, not just cartoons. This is a fiber without our material. These, the fibers coated with our materials, and we could actually control the thickness of the coating without, a, without damaging the integrity of the fiber. So the fiber still would be, you know, uh, you could stretch it, you could do whatever you want without uh, destroying its uh, properties. And we could even in our group now, there is a company is making uh, hundreds of meters. We could make a meter of these uh, textile that it's used uh, just in my, in my lab. And we are a research lab, we are not a production lab. Everything looks good. Does it work in a catalysis? Yes. The fibers work just as good as the powder we were doing uh, in, you know, if you take your powder and you put it in the beaker or in a mask, now we could put it on a textile and it works exactly the same. It works with the agent itself. But one thing we had to worry about right now, how to put everything together, how to put our moths on the fiber, how to put this particular polymer on the fiber, and how to rely on only the humidity in the air. So what I showed you a couple slides ago here, this is we are still giving it, giving the reaction water. That means we are feeding the reaction water. But if the soldier in the desert, the soldier should not worry about feeding the reaction anything. They need to worry about other things that not worry about is their suit working or not, which means we need we know how to put polymer on the fiber. We know how to put moths on the fiber. The question is, how can we utilize the water in the air, and that's it, and get the reaction to work? So this particular moth I showed you, it has another property. Besides it's a good catalyst, it actually loves water. It loves water so much that if you are, if you put it outside, and if you are, any place that has relative humidity higher than 20%. And trust me, there is not many places around the world with less than 20%. That means this material should work in almost 99% of the places around the world. If you, if you are just having it outside, the inside the cavities of this material already filled with water without having to give this moth any water externally. It just captures the water from the air. We came up with another technique. It's called dip coating. The way industry nowadays coats uh, jeans with different colors. So this is a, a scalable 
a technique because if you want to make something that you want somebody to commercialize it, you have to come up with techniques that they are, uh, can be commercialized and can be scaled. And you could see now that this, the actual textile, how it looks like, it's covered very well. It works brilliantly. We could test it against, you know, the, the soldier's sweat, CO2 in the air, uh, the octane that is coming from the, uh, a Humvee, because if you are in a battlefield, there is a lot of contaminants there, and still this material works brilliantly the way we did it in the lab. And it works against the agent itself. So all that, it worked beautiful. There is a startup company in Scope, Illinois. Now they are working with the Department of Defense to scale up this material and to field it. Hopefully, you will hear me talk in another year or two. We're not talking about 20 years. In a year or two, that I will be telling you about the soldiers' suits that they are wearing that has our materials in them. We are very close. Uh, with that, uh, I hope I showed you uh, learning from how a bad sponge works, learning from how an enzyme functions. We are able to put uh, these concepts together to make a material to protect our soldiers. And hopefully, anytime you work with the Department of Defense, Typically, that technology will be transferred sooner or later to the civilian population, which is always a good thing. With that, thank you. Happy to answer any questions and chat uh, in details.